be here again in San Diego. In the epistle for the Taken from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 24. At that time I have brought forth a pleasant odor, and my flowers are the fruit of honor and riches, and the mother of fair love, and of fear, and of knowledge, and of holy hope. In me is all grace of the, of the way and of the truth. In me is all hope of life and of virtue. Come over to me, all ye that desire me, and be filled with my fruits. For my spirit is sweet above honey, in my inheritance above honey and the honeycomb. My memory is unto everlasting generations. They that eat me shall yet hunger. They that drink me shall yet thirst. He that hearkeneth to me shall not, not be confounded. And they that work by me shall not sin. They that explain me shall have life everlasting. Then the gospel. Taking that according to St. Luke. Chapter 1. At that time, the angel Gabriel was sent from God into a city called Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel being come in said unto her, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, who having heard was troubled at his saying, and thought within herself what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found grace with God. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father. And he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be done? Because I know not man. And the angel answering said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she also hath conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, that is called barren. Because no word shall be impossible with God. Mary said, Behold the hand of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Those are the words of today's holy God. Today is a feast of the holy name of Mary. And also just a note. That we should keep in our prayers, Father Anthony Chicada, who was a priest ordained by Jesus of the Feb in the early 70s, and in 1983 became one of the nine priests who broke away from the society in, uh, in the United States. And then he died uh, yesterday morning, and of course, was a great apologist for uh, the state of Vicanda's position, and uh, you know, one of the great uh, apologists of the position that the Pope was not the Pope, and that, uh, so in any case, we were against his position there. In fact, it was. If I wanted to have a discussion or debate with him this last year, uh, who was never able to completely set it up due to his failing health, did speak with him, and he was very kind to me and so on a few times, but we were never able to establish that discussion. And then Father Chicada died yesterday morning, remained faithful in his priesthood, faithful to the true mass, and uh, you know, trying to take care of his flock there in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, Archbishop of the Fed was say concerning those priests, that he didn't agree with their state of economism, and agree with the, some of the things that they did in their decisions of the split, which occurred, which caused the split of 1983 and the Sinai St. the X, but that he was grateful that they were persevering in their priesthood and still taking care of souls. And uh, so, and then, uh, so in any case, so we keep Father Chicada in our prayers, who had uh, who died with all the sacraments and uh, yesterday uh, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, so we pray for his soul and. Also, note here that uh, it is interesting that in the last uh, in the last few weeks since I was consecrated a bishop, now a little more than a month ago, uh, there the controversy arose whether or not Bishop Father Pfeiffer became Bishop Pfeiffer. 
And that, uh, you know, Greg Taylor wrote a little thing about the recruitment, one of his little monthly or uh, several times a year newsletter. And in it, he quotes Father Jakarta, a long letter of Father Jakarta, uh, in, uh, which he wrote in the 1980s, early 80s, against the Tuk uh, consecrations. And it's interesting that Greg chose to do that because it's a bit like you're given a treatise on Moses. And we say, well, Moses, we was one that spoke to God. And he said to God, I don't want to be a prophet. I don't want to let the Jewish people go. Uh, he even, I didn't even circumcise my own kid. And I stutter. And that this is, is this the kind of man you want to be a prophet? Is this the kind of man that you want to let the people go out of Egypt? But rumor has it that Moses may have changed his mind. And that is what Greg Taylor did in his recent requisite. He said that uh, here is an interesting article of Father Chicada, who is the defender of the Took consecrations being valid, who wrote the best clear theological treaties from the theologians of the past 2,000 years, proving definitively that the Took consecrations are valid. And yet he put, and yet he chose to use an article of 1982 of Father of Father Anthony Chicada, who just died yesterday and uh, who, uh, who died in peace yesterday, and we pray for his soul. But Father Chikata did say in 1982, a peace against the Tuk consecrations. Our Bishop Tuk was a, a, a Vietnamese Catholic bishop, of five years older than Archbishop Lefebvre, ordained in the 1930s, I mean the tw 1920s, consecrated bishop in the 1930s, and, and he consecrated some bishops in the 70s, and in the early, in 1876, a little bit later, and then in 81. And these bishops are responsible for many, many Catholic priests, and also bishops, which in fact I am one, one of the bishops, my priesthood comes from Archbishop Lefebvre, and Episcopacy from Archbishop Took, and that, that, uh, the, uh, that there are priests saying the Latin Mass and taking care of souls throughout the world because of Archbishop Took uh, consecrating some uh, bishops. And some argued that these consecrations were not valid because he was a bad man, because he was not doing the right thing, because uh, he didn't have his mind, he wasn't sound of mind, etc., and other foolish statements. And Father Chikata did write in 1982 an article that's quoted in the records of number 53 by Greg Taylor. He did write that there is, here are some scandals of, of Took, here are some scandals of some priests and bishops that he consecrated. But then he retracted all that very clearly, very, just a few years later. And then wrote a very long treatise explaining clearly how he was wrong in his previous judgment, and that in the reason he changed his mind was because he studied the Catholic faith and Catholic theology and Catholic theologians and moral theologians, canon lawyers and dogmatic theologians on the matter, and found that they are unanimous in their teaching that under the circumstances of took consecrated bishops, they are consecrated, and that canon law, moral theology, and dogmatic theology say clearly that they are valid. And as far as the mistakes made by some of those men that he consecrated, or the error in judgment that he made in consecrating one or two of several of one or two of them, that this has nothing to do with the sacrament, nothing to do with the holy order and the priesthood or the episcopacy of those priests or bishops ordained by him. And we can add also that if we look about the holiness of the line, one priest said earlier that a few months a few months ago to one of our people from in South America. He said that the sins of the bishop, the sins of the bishop who consecrates are passed on to the children. And then, of course, this is said of, uh, uh, to those whom he consecrates, the stain is passed on. Whereas the Lord Jesus Christ said in the gospel very clearly that the sins of the father don't pass on to the children, and that the child should be responsible for his own, his own sins, his own punishment. A man was born blind. And the, the apostles came to Jesus Christ and said, is he born blind because of his own sins, because of his parents' sins, or of something else? And God said to the, children, to the, the apostles, he was not born blind because of his parents' sins. He was born blind that you might receive the faith. He was born blind to show the greatness and the power of God that even a man born blind can be cured of blindness, which is what he did in the Gospel of St. John chapter 9. And if we look at the line of promise, it's called the line of promise, the holy line of promise. It is not called the line of holy men. It's the line of promise, and that is God made a promise to Adam that one of your children, and he made a promise to Noah, one of your children, and he made a promise to Abraham, one of your children, 
and he made a promise to David, one of your children will be the Messiah. And he kept his promise. Does that mean that the children of Adam will all be good? The majority of his children, unfortunately, go to hell. Does that mean the children of Noah will all be good? Every single son in the world today, every human being in the world today is a son of Noah. Every human being of the seven billion people on earth. Are they all good? No. But they are the sons of Noah, and many of them are damned. And what about the sons of Abraham? And what about the sons of David? And the direct line of promise itself, the direct line which takes us from Adam all the way to Jesus Christ. When we look at that holy line, what do we see? It is filled with all kinds of unholiness. We have Tamar, who, by an act of prostitution, had two children, the twins, and one of them is the grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have Rahab, who was a prostitute, and who was chosen by God in order to be the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, the mother of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the grandmother of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And when did she show her greatness? When her house of prostitution was open for business. And three spies came to the house of prostitution, and they said, Rahab the prostitute, save us. And she said, I will save you on condition that you tell your God, and you tell your God to tell Joshua not to kill me and those in my house. And they, they, they paid the bargain, and they made the condition. And she was saved and all in her house, and she became the grandmother of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have the sins of Roboam, the son of, 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 of Solomon, who was born of Solomon, lived a wicked life, ruled the Jewish people in great wickedness according to the sacred scripture and the Holy Ghost, lived in impurity, built in, uh, statues to the idols, died a death, an enemy of God, and he is the great grandfather of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the great grandfather of our Lord Jesus Christ. The line of promise continues in the most wicked Rab Roboam, Rahab, who began wicked but then repented. Tamar, who also began good, then became wicked and then repented. And then and others who remained wicked all their days, but they passed on from generation to generation the promise that was given by God through Adam, through Noah, through Abraham, through David, all the way down until we arrived to St. Joseph and the Blessed Virgin Mary, who were cousins and who were, who were the Blessed Virgin Mary, truly of the house of David, Joseph, truly of the house of David, and that from this, from this house came the Messiah, and the line of promise was maintained. Now we have also the line of promise of the New Testament. And in the line of promise of the New Testament, there will be many wicked bishops. It is the bishops and priests who are the line of promise of the New Testament. Every priest is a priest because a bishop put his hand upon his head. And every bishop is a bishop because another bishop put his hand upon his head. And there's an unbroken chain of promise from Jesus Christ. When at the Last Supper, he placed the hands upon the head of the twelve apostles. All the way down to St. Peter II, who will be the last pope, and the last saints of the last days. That line and chain will never be broken. Even in our most wicked age, in which there are so many wicked priests and so many wicked bishops. The tie of the promise is maintained, and the wickedness and the sins of the Father do not pass on to the Son. So Father Jakarta says rightly in his treatise, that is published in 1992, when the attorney changed his mind much before that, but it published in 1992. The theology and dogma, moral theologians and canonists say clearly, according to moral and dogmatic theology, once there's a fact of a consecration, this bishop put the hand on the head of the others, he did the essential formula, he, see, he did, had the intention to do what the church does, and the man accepted consecration, that's it, he's consecrated, he's ordained, the priesthood is passed on. And furthermore, as it says in the Code of Canon Law, the Canon 1994, paragraph 1 of the old Code of Canon Law, no one has the right to question or accuse the validity or the obligations of the priest, except for the bishop himself, the priest himself, or someone who's directly involved in the diocese and um, in, in the, in the working with the priest, and that this cannot be done. And furthermore, the accusation is to be, and when it is made, does the law of the canon law states clearly that the, the, there must be a defensor, of a defender of the validity of the ordination, just like there's a defender of the bond in a marriage case. In a marriage case, the defensor of Inkley 
the defendants are legally matrimony, he must say that the defender of the bond of matrimony, he must, he must, if the, the matrimony is considered valid until it is proven definitively that it is invalid. And the, the, the burden of proof is upon he who is the accuser. And that this principle must also be followed, followed the defender of the bond of the priesthood. That is, the defender of the validity of the priesthood and the defender of the obligations of the priesthood. And so that if someone says, I don't think Father really was, who was obliged to do these, to oblige to chastity and oblige to the bravery and oblige to obedience to his bishop, he didn't know that. No, there is no doubt about that. He is, he's a priest. He has those obligations. And what about the doubt of his ordination? The same thing. You have the doubt of the validity of the ordination. The defender of the bond must say that the, the ordination is to be considered valid. It cannot be doubted. Neither can marriage be doubted. Because if, if, if you cannot prove that you're not validly married, you are validly married. But the very fact that a man and woman got together in front of a priest, that's a valid marriage. And if they say it's invalid, they must prove definitively that she or he did something to break validity. Unless it's proven definitively beyond all reasonable doubt before a judge then all are obliged to accept the marriage as marriage. And canon law says the same thing with regard to priesthood, that as regards ordination to priesthood, the rules of the trial concerning matrimony are to be applied, and that the matrimony is considered valid until it is definitively proven to be invalid, and no one has the right to question it, and all must act as though the couple is married, including the new man who wants to marry the girl, including the new girl that wants to marry the man, including the husband and wife living together. They must behave and live as married. And the new man cannot pretend as though she's free to marry, nor can the new woman pretend as though she's, she's, she's free to marry. Uh, the, the new man is free to marry. And so, therefore, the same rule be applied as regards ordination. And Father Chikata points that out well in his treatise, and that he was, made, he was the great defender of the took consecrations. And it's interesting that Mr. Taylor decides to say... We do a long article of, of uh, Father Chikata by which he simply says bad things about the moral character of some of the individuals who were consecrated by Took. And then he's, he retracts that later. And he also says that it has to do with the sacrament itself, not about the moral character, good or bad. Just like St. Thomas Aquinas says in question 60 of the Terence of of the Summa, St. Thomas Aquinas says, just as the faith of the minister is not does not make a sacrament valid, so the lack of faith in the minister does not make it invalid. He simply must do what the church does. He is acts in the persona Christi, and after the persona Christi, Christ is, is passed on. So Father Jakarta did write a good theological treatise and a very clear defense of the validity of the two consecrations, and uh, he remained faithful in his priesthood until he died yesterday morning, and so do keep him in your prayers. And then also that it's a bit uh, in, in disingenuous and incorrect of Mr. Taylor to put it as requisite, a long article of, of, of Father Chikata saying that he questioned the two consecrations, but rumor has it he might have changed his mind. Like rumor has it Moses may have changed his mind and after all decided to go into Egypt. Know that this, this is foolishness and, and really uh, dishonest to do, use this kind of tactics. But in any case, it's not correct. But today is the feast of the holy name of Mary, and remember that uh, this this name is never spoken of in hell. The name is never spoken in hell. It is the one name that that, that cannot be spoken in that place because it is the name of she that crushes the head of the serpent, and the name of the one that defeated Satan. And so, therefore, this name cannot be spoken in that place. And whenever we are connected to her holy name, that is why one of the most powerful weapons against the devil is simply to say, Ave Maria. And remember when that first Ave Maria happened, the angel Gabriel came down to the house of Nazareth, and Blessed Virgin Mary was 15 years old. And she was inside of that house of Nazareth, knocked on the door, opened the door up, and, she, and he said, Ave Maria. What happened when he said Ave Maria? When he said Ave Maria, it was a direct spit and a direct attack against Lucifer himself. Because when, when, the, when, the, when, when the, the angel Gabriel said Ave Maria, he said, this is the woman that was prophesied 4,004 years ago when God created the world. And he said there will come a man, a Messiah, a God-made man. And this man, this Messiah will have a mother and she will be above all the angels. And finally, the angel Gabriel sees that woman and he does not respond 
like Lucifer did. Lucifer was disgusted by the idea that a lower creature, man, billions of creatures below him in dignity, and not only of man, but a woman who is lower in dignity than man, the female is lower in dignity than the, than the male in, 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 amongst the human race, and that she will then have not only be above men, but she will be above all the angels as well. And he could not tolerate that. And therefore he said, Non serviam, I will not serve. Finally, 4,004 years later, the angel Gabriel goes to the house of Nazareth. The door is open and he is able to see with his angelic eyes the beauty of that woman, the magnificence of the star of the sea, the magnificence of the lady. For Mary means lady. There is no lady who is not lady without being connected to her. If you're not connected to Mary, you cannot be lady. And she is the star of the sea. She also means star of the sea. Maria also means sea. And the star of the sea. She is the star of the sea by which sailors can get across the sea only by looking to the stars. If they don't look to the star that guides them in navigation, no sailor can make it across the sea. And so likewise, as we travel across the sea of this wicked world, no one can get to heaven no one can cross over the other side without looking up to the Maria, to the star of the sea, to marry. And so she is the, the one that's the star of the sea, and we cannot have dignity, we cannot have hope, we cannot have order in our lives, we can't have happiness, we can't have beauty without a lady. And the lady of ladies is Mary. Therefore, when the angel of Abraham opened that door, and he saw that most beautiful of all ladies, the most wonderful of all guides, he simply said, Ave Maria. And in that Ave Maria, he did exactly what Lucifer should have done 4,004 years before. But he refused because of his pride. And he gave the right response, St. Gabriel did. Ave Maria, hail Mary. And then flowed from his heart was what he saw inside of Mary. And therefore he said, Grazia plena, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. And remember when he said, the Lord is with thee. The Lord Jesus Christ has not yet entered her womb. That will be a few minutes later. This is before the incarnation comes inside of her. There's something so beautiful about Mary. Something so wonderful about that name and that lady that holds that name. That she has in her the presence of God in a most sacred way. Very similar to the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. She is the Ark. Of the covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament did not have the real presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant had a symbolic presence of God. The Ark had on it two cherubs facing each other and an empty seat. And on that empty seat was the invisible presence of God, but not his physical presence. And that invisible presence was so beautiful, so powerful, that the high priest alone could go in that presence one day out of the year. In the name of all the people, the high priest would go one day out of the year in that presence. And, no, and otherwise, no one could go into the Holy of Holies. And what's the Holy of Holies? The place where the ark has the invisible presence of God. And when the angel Gabriel looked at the angel, the Blessed Virgin Mary, he saw something more beautiful than the original Ark of the Covenant. He saw the presence of God, more present in her than was in that original ark. That Moses carried around, and that was carried around all the way until the time of Jeremiah, and then hidden by Jeremiah the prophet. And that holy ark was nothing compared to the holiness of this woman. And hence he said, Ave Maria, gratia plena. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee right now, and blessed art thou amongst women. He said all those words, and then there shall be a fruit of thy womb, Jesus. There is going to be a fruit of thy womb that this holiness inside of her, the beauty inside of her, makes it possible for the Holy Ghost to overshadow her and the power of the Most High to come over her who is called Mary. And then the God, God the Son shall become hypothetically united to the humanity of Jesus Christ inside of the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He is going to come out in nine months on December the 25th in the cave of Bethlehem and he will come out a king. He will come out a warrior. He will come out God made man. He will destroy Satan. And it all began when the angel saw the beauty of that girl and simply said, Maria. Ave Maria. St. Bernard tells us, who says this says all. There's nothing else to say. 
She is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. She is the one who is full of grace. She is the one who has the Lord with her. And therefore, whoever is with Mary shall also be filled with grace. And whoever is with Mary shall have the Lord with them. And they'll have a most blessed fruit of all of our works. Because if Jesus Christ is not in our works, and our works are a waste of time, they are of no benefit. Be connected to the holy name of Mary. Be connected to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And then our fruits, there's going to be a fruit from our, from our work. A fruit from her womb, a fruit from our work. So in any case, we thank God for the holy name of Mary. And we want to live according to that name. Keep that name close unto us. And let's not fall into error. Not fall into heresy. Not fall into the violations of the faith, hope, and charity. And this is not possible without the mother of fair love. That she who is the, the who is who is the mother of the faith, mother of the hope, mother of charity, mother of the way, the mother of the truth, mother of the life, as it says essentially in the epistle of the mass today, and that uh, they be connected closely to her, say her holy name, the Ave Maria, Ave Maria. Remember when the children of Fatima said their their their, their rosaries, they had the plan, and so they decided a short version of the rosary, Ave Maria, a holy Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. That's all they said. Ave Maria, Sancta Maria, Ave Maria, Sancta Maria, Ave Maria, Sancta Maria, and they skipped all the rest. It's a lot faster way to say the rosary. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to them and said, I am very happy with your, that you're saying those rosaries. That's what she said. I'm very happy that you're saying Ave Maria and Sancta Maria. That's the essentials. But I would even be more happy if you're saying the whole thing. So can you try to say the whole thing next time? Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord is with thee. But she didn't say she was angry with them for their short version. She loved to hear them say, Ave Maria, Santa Maria. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. Hail Mary, Holy Mary. And these have great power. Just the Hail Mary and the Holy Mary, those words alone have great power. Because the Holy Name of Mary defeats Satan. The Holy Name of Mary fills us with Christ. The Holy Name of Mary drives out all filth and sin inside of us. The Holy Name of Mary makes us in peace in our hearts. Drives out heresy. Drives out all evil. Makes us filled with love, gives us happiness. And so we say a lot when we say Ave Maria. There isn't much else that needs to be said. Just love the Ave Maria, love the holy name of Mary, and say it in our hearts. And she will be pleased whenever we say that holy name from our hearts. Ave Maria, Santa Maria, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. And may she always be with us until we be with her and her son in heaven forever. Blessed be with you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.